The Jewish nation is not based on race. The Jewish nation is not based on ethnicity. The Jewish nation is based on culture and religion. The Bundist movement includes both religious and non-observant Jewry. The political position of the Jewish Bund is not anti-religious. The political position of the Jewish Bund is non-religious. The Jewish struggle is deeply connected to the Palestinian struggle. On December 19th of 2017, young Ahed Tamimi was arrested by Israeli troops in the middle of the night. Her only crime was resisting occupation. In fact, she committed no crime at all. Rightfully, the Palestinians say that her arrest was politically motivated. And although this is the truth, the Zionist government denies this. You will not get any true insight into the facts surrounding the unlawful arrest of Ahed Tamimi by watching Fox News, CNN, NBC, ABC, CBS, InfoWars, The Blaze, or any other Americanist media. The State of Israel was founded against the will of the Jewish nation. The State of Israel is based on the ideology of Zionism. It is important to remember that the country that calls itself Israel was founded against the will of the Jewish nation. Zionism is a concept that is forced on the Jewish nation. Long before the Zionists harmed any Palestinians, world Jewry spoke out against such a despotic ideology. To understand the context of the Jewish nation, one must grasp the proper historical context of a nation and nationality. To understand nation and nationality, a proper grasp of people must be understood. A people is a plurality of persons considered as a whole, such as a religious group, a ethnic group, or a cultural group. So, what is a nation? A nation is a culture plus. This means that a people of culture and religion constitutes a nation. Likewise, a people of culture and ethnicity constitutes a nation. Not every nation has a country, nor does every nation want or need a country? For example, the French nation has a country called France. Yet, the, the Romani Gypsy nation is without a country. A major part of the very livelihood of the Romani Gypsy nation is that of a nomadic culture. Another source of confusion is that much of the world has forgotten the differences between territory, country, and state. Territories are locational communities founded on mutual gathering. Countries are locational communities founded on sovereign province. The sovereignty of a country can be anything from a manifesto to a sovereign leadership. Just as a nation may not have a country, not every country is nationally based. States are countries under the control of bureaucratic ownership. In other words, state is the bureaucratic estate of a country. Nation-states are despotic fusions of nation and state. In other words, nation-state is bureaucratic enslavement of a nation. For both religious and cultural reasons, the Jewish nation rejects any notion of a Jewish country. More importantly, world Jewry rejects any claims of a Jewish state. Most importantly, the Jewish nation rejects any notion of a Jewish nation state, especially any nation state taking the collective name of Israel. 
This is Abraham Weisfeld, Ph.D. The clip you are about to see is from a documentary called Civil Resistance. It came out in 2011, uh, or it took place at 2011 at uh, the village of Kufar Kadum. One should note that in distance, down the road, next to the highway that is being blocked, are the Zionist colonies, otherwise called settlements, that present a front line of action in a defensive war against the Palestinian villagers. These v villages put into place by the Zionist movement encroach upon the Palestinian lands and whose members regularly take control of the various villagers' lands, olive orchards, to destroy these trees and to prevent the villagers from going to collect the harvest in the fall time of the olive trees themselves. The Western public and the Jewish communities in particular are led to believe that the West Bank is a peaceful region where the Palestine Authority has accepted the rule of the Zionist military occupation. The majority of the Jewish people in North America, yes, Canada, the United States do not want the occupation. Israel does not speak for us. The settlers they do not speak for us. We speak for ourselves. We, the Jewish people, say stop the occupation. This is Rabbi David Feldman. Uh, this clip you are about to see uh, was aired, I believe, on December 7th, 2017. Again, this is uh, Rabbi David Feldman. Uh, the show that this is taken from is from The Bridge Show. Again, the man being interviewed here is Rabbi David Feldman. How are you, Mr. Rabbi David Friedman? Fine, right? fine. Yeah, hi, how are you? Fine, 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 and you? You have an organization that's been uh, since 1938, I believe. Right. Talk to me about your organization. Uh, this organization called Nature Carta International, uh, this is Aramaic for the protectors of the city, referring to the holy city of Jerusalem. It's the city we are dealing today about. Uh, oh. This was at the time of the the beginning of the philosophy of Zionism before 1948, before the, the creation of the State of Israel, when the Jewish religious leaders of Palestine realized that this new philosophy of Zionism is going to destroy everyone, the Jewish people living in Palestine, the Palestinian Jews, okay. and the Palestinian inhabit the non-Jewish Palestinian Are inhabitants. Uh, this was obviously a danger. It was about Judaism, where the Jewish leaders at the time found that this is going to destroy the Jewish religion. Why? Because this new philosophy of Zionism was a new philosophy, a new invention amongst Jewish people to, to form a national homeland for Jews. Okay, now, all right, now it just so happens that Abraham Weisfeld, Ph.D., and Rabbi David Feldman know each other and have been in demonstrations of solidarity with each other more than once. This has everything to do with the fact that the Jewish Bundist diaspora movement recognizes certain basically the Nateria Carta International as the leaders of our generation. As the Jewish Bundist diaspora movement is a political organization, we therefore cannot claim leadership over the religiosity. And so we had to at some point define who among the altar orthodox represents all of world Jewry as the leaders of our generation, we have concluded that it's Nateria Karta. 
Rabbi David Feldman, Rabbi David Feldman is a very, very gracious man, and uh, the conversations between him and Dr. Abram Weisfeld have been very warm. This is a picture of the two of them in an anti-Zionist protest. December 6th, 2017, the day of disaster. When I came into office, I promised to look at the world's challenges with open eyes and very fresh thinking. All right, now I have tried to figure out how to respond to all this pollution that runs through this person's mouth, this person we call the president. You know, it's interesting how the libertarian capitalists, you know, those those capitalists, like the, the ones that always listens to uh, Alex Jones and said, oh, it's not capitalism, it's corporatism, and then they would use a vague quote from Mussolini, out of context, by the way. And by the way, I don't like Mussolini as I don't like fascism, but you cannot call strychnine freaking uh, cancer. It's not the same thing. You cannot call uh, you, you 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 can't call food poisoning a headache. You can't call uh, <laughs> you, you, you you can't call athlete's foot lung cancer, and you can't call. I, 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 I'm already screwing this up. You see, I have now tried over and over and over again to respond to this. And as far as official recordings that have been done in response to this whole speech, this will now be the third time that I've actually attempted to. I, I've, I've practiced several times. I've, I've tried it every way I can. I don't know how to respond exactly to the level of inaccuracies of what this entails and, and, and what he's saying and how he has to know what he's saying. Let me start by saying this, okay? There's no way that the President of the United States is not aware of what Israel is doing concerning Palestine, okay? When it comes to the state of Israel and the now officially, by the way, recognized state of Palestine, um, it is known that it is the Palestinians who have kept with the Oslo Accords and not the State of Israel. That Yasser Arafat did everything that was asked of him and with each Prime Minister of Israel they continue to violate those treaties. Land grab after land grab after land grab after land grab in the West Bank and Gaza is uh, now the biggest open-air prison. And that's another thing. The wall around the wall around Mexico, this is the same thing. Mexicans are like those of the Palestinians. They're the, the, the same dilemma. You yell at a Mexican and tell him or her that, that he or she is an immigrant. Understand what you're doing is you're saying that to a Native American. They are the Aztec people. In fact, the Aztec word for Aztec is Michica. So, uh... Now you know where the word Mexican comes from. It comes from the word Machica, which is the Aztec word for Aztec, is Machica, which, oh my gosh, yes, Mexicans are Native American. Who knew? Oh, wait, I did. I guess it's easy for me, because as I'm a Sephardic Jew, I'm Sephardi, you know, a Spanish Jewish person, I'm Latino, I'm Hispanic. I'm Latino because Latino would be Spanish, French, Portuguese, Italian, or even Romanian. Oh, yes, that's right, that's all Latino. That's me. Okay, and then on top of it, I'm Hispanic because I am Spanish, Sephardi Jewish, you know, Spanish. I am Hispanic. Mexicans are not. And you can go around saying, well, they, they have Spanish blood. A lot of black people have Caucasian blood now, and a lot of Caucasians have black blood. But you don't call those people like part Caucasian and 
part black and no because it doesn't work that way there is no race there's ethnic backgrounds okay Mexicans are Native American Palestinians are the ancient Israelite tribes by the way which most converted to either Christianity or Islam right but the announcement that's going to be made is going to be very dangerous because it accelerates what Israel uh, their aggressive pa capacities this is very bad All right, so <clears throat> We're just, I'm going to go to the next clip. Therefore, I have determined that it is time to officially recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Oh, wow. So, okay. Jerusalem is the holy city to that is sacred to um, three religions, and it, it was handed over just now to it, from this speech to the Zionist apartheid state. Okay, let me get really basic if I possibly can. There is no Zion in Zionism. Zionism is a crusade but instead of having the banner of a cross it has the banner of the star of david okay just as it was a bunch of catholics who were ignorant and couldn't read their own bible and probably didn't even know half of their own catechism were so ignorant that they could be duped into political campaigns and then they became crusaders since the holocaust a lot of the Jewish leadership has been, you know, has been gone. And the fact of the matter is Jewish people are simply ignorant as to what Jewish people are. So much to the point where you now have a lot of Jewish people who think that there's a Jewish race. There is no Jewish race. There is no Jewish ethnicity. I'm getting really tired of hearing about things like that. I mean, I, I would like to make clear that the Jewish people have been against Zionism since its inception. Originally, Zionism was dependent on the false narrative of some kind of Jewish race or the idea of ethnic Jews. I'm also hearing a lot of nonsense about Jewish DNA, okay? Uh, lately, there is, 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 is... Lately, I've heard this. There, There is no Jewish day. Actually, th that usually refers to Ashkenazi DNA. And, of course, the Ashkenazim are uh, predominantly Jewish. However, no one calls uh, Pakistani people... Uh, having nobody says that Pakistani DNA is is Muslim DNA, but the Pakistanis are predominantly Muslim. So why can't you just call their DNA Muslim DNA? No, you can't do that. See, there are no ethnic Jews. Judaism is a cultural religion, and I would I would also like to make clear that I don't hate the Ashkenazim. I'm not using them as a reference as a point of bad. It's just that actually I'll put it this way: as far as people who've practiced Judaism, the best comes from Ashkenazim and the worst. The, the worst that came from Ashkenazim was Zionism, and the best was the Yiddish language, which I would say is universally the Jewish language, whereas Hebrew is the holy language. Nothing against um, m m my language, uh, Ladino or Judo-Spanish or, or Judo-Arabic or any of the other languages that emerged particularly from Jewish people. I have nothing against those languages. And those languages ought to be preserved, and in fact, the Boon would like to have those languages preserved. But across the board, I would say Yiddish is the Jewish language. So it's nothing against Ashkenazim, to make that clear. In fact, much of my... In I may be Sephardi, but my upbringing was from Ashkenazi rabbis. Okay, they were Hasidic and pre... What, what, are, what are they typically? Typically, not all the time, but usually Hasidic rabbis are Ashkenazi. And so, I wish people would stop talking about all this Jewish DNA nonsense, because it, it feeds a false narrative with a false history in mind. The ancient Israelite tribes, most of them converted to Islam or Christianity. And would you accuse uh, every Ishmaelite Arab of being a Muslim? No. Would you accuse every Muslim of being an Ishmaelite Arab? No. Would you accuse every Greek 
of being a Christian? No. Would you accuse every Christian of being a Greek? No. Then why is it you have to assume that there's a Jewish uh, ethnic background? Is it because it's a cultural religion? Judaism's not the only cultural religion. Okay? It, it, it's not the only nation based more on a religion as opposed to an ethnic background. Take the Hindus, for instance. Hindu is actually a nation. I'm not talking about India. India is a country. It's not an ethnic background even. India is a country with many ethnic and religious groups inside of it. Okay, that's another thing. Country is not always state, and state is... Yeah, so... It's... It's not rocket science. It's simplistic. The fact is, it takes a lot of energy to brainwash people into not seeing what's more evident, but... It should also be obvious that religions and cultures emerge organically and are not institutions of control, as is often espoused. It is time for all civilized nations and people to respond to disagreement with reasoned debate, not violence. I, I don't know how to respond to this. <clears throat> you know, this will be the third time uh, I believe it's the third time that I've attempted to reply. And even this time, I just seem to be ranting. And I, I don't know how to explain how wrong this is. I mean, I, 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 I can explain how wrong it is, but I would, I would have to take up the whole program almost at this point to respond to how this guy says. Let me bring you, if anything, to um, this picture right here. And it should be followed with some video footage that I really think you should see. Rabbi Moshe Hirsch was a member of Nitria Karta. I am as uncertain, very uncertain, as to when this news clip aired. I mean, I could make a guess, but I don't want to risk inaccuracy, because I do think I know when, but I'm not entirely sure. So because I'm not entirely sure, I won't risk giving a date. But I've been very aware of this clip for a while. That's before it became known on YouTube. So what I know for sure is that at the very start of this film, the person studying with Rabbi Moshe Hirsch is his son, Rabbi Mira Hirsch. Meyer Hirsch, sorry. Uh, Rabbi Meyer Hirsch. One of the best features of Nateria Karta is that they accept both Hasidism, Hasidim and Mignagam within their membership. They may even take strands from the Sephardim. Nateria Karta leaps beyond sectarianism within the ultra orthodox. And so, um, the fact that Nateria Karta uh, disqualifies Chabad, which was known as an ultra orthodox sect of Judaism. The fact that Nitri Karta has disqualified Chabad some time ago says much about that situation, as they are very <laughs> non-sectarian about the ultra-Orthodox positions. Anyway, in early February of this year, of 2018, Rabbi Meir Hirsch was interviewed by Dr. Weisweild in the city of Jerusalem. <laughs> Meet Rabbi Hirsch. I am the Minister for Jewish Affairs. But not in Israel. He's the Minister of Jewish Affairs in Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat's cabinet. He's the Palestinian's rabbi. The state of Israel will never have the right to exist. The Jewish nation will exist in the Holy Land when God redeems the Jewish people through his Messiah. Rabbi Hirsch thinks Yasser Arafat should rule the Holy Land, not the Jews. The English were here, they left. The Turks were here and they left. And we were left stateless. So when Mr. Arafat says, I am setting up a kosher state and a kosher sovereignty, what could be better? Strange words in the context of the Arab-Israeli conflict, which has pitted Palestinians against Zionists for decades. Rabbi Hirsch is always there when Arafat greets world leaders in the West Bank and Gaza. Well, now rise a state of Israel does not exist, and it will cease to exist. Whether the messianic era, era will appear in our lifetime or not, we are in the hands of God. All right, so now as for this next clip, which also has uh, Rabbi um, Moshe Hirsch in it, and you're also going to see in the same video 
Uh, yes, the Arafat. I do not know when this aired or if it's from a documentary or where it came from. However, the previous one, as I stated, I had seen it several times and I know about uh, Rabbi Moshe Hirsch, who is dead, sadly. Uh, but his son is alive and has taken over his position. But anyway, um, I don't know where this next film came from originally, but I do know that it was posted on the Naturia Carta's YouTube channel, as that's where we had gotten it from. And it's a matter of public information, so it fits perfectly fine with this documentary, and I do want everyone to see this. We take great pleasure in presenting to you our beloved president, Abu Amar, this precious time instrument. We adjusted one set of the dials on the watch according to the biblical pattern of measuring time of life. The Western world uses another clockage system based on 12 o'clock midnight. Mm -hmm. But we, the Palestinians, Jewish and Muslims, use the one based on the day beginning after the sun sets. We hope and pray that this sacred watch will benefit the Palestinian people, led by its noble leader, President Abu Ammar, by enabling them to conform with King Solomon's prudent analysis of time in Ecclesiastes 3. May we all be worthy of witnessing the Messianic era, a paradise for the human race on earth in our time, inshallah. Thank you. I do know. Mr. President, can I ask you a trick question about yes, yes. the relation with, uh, with Red Irish? Very old relation. Uh, we can say that uh, more, than 20, to, uh, more than 20 years ago. You appreciate him? Yes, sir. And what? I am very happy to have, I am very proud to have this uh, relation with him. What uh, you can tell us about Red Irish? He is my brother. And I used to call him my father. President Donald Trump, shame on you. Jerusalem is the capital of Palestine. The state of Israel, on the other hand, has no right to exist. Jerusalem is a holy place, sacred to three religions. The Tanakh is the Jewish Bible. The Quran is the Muslim Bible. Yet in Islam, one must understand the Hadith in order to understand the Quran. Likewise, in Judaism, one must understand the Talmud in order to understand the Tanakh. The Talmud is against Zionism and the State of Israel because the Talmud forbids the ending of Jewish exile. Uma is a collective term for all the world's Muslims. Church is a collective term for all the world's Christians. Israel is a collective term for all of world Jewry. Church is not a building according to the Bible of Christianity. In fact, what people often refer to as church in the context of a religious building is actually more correctly referred to as a parish. In fact, if you dig deep into the context of both the Christian Bible and catechism, this is evident. Muslims go to mosque on Friday, Christians go to parish on Sunday. Jewish people go to synagogue 
on Shabbos. For the Christians, there shall be massive problems as long as a parish can be confused with the word church. For the Jewish people, there shall be massive problems as long as the word Israel can be confused for a country. The very word Israel is a collective term for world Jewry. The most important texts in Judaism are the five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Each of the five books of Moses are divided into parshas. Each parsha is a section of the five books of Moses used in Jewish liturgy during a single week. The weekly parsha is chanted publicly by a designated reader in Jewish prayer services, starting with a partial reading on the afternoon of Shabbos, then again during the Monday and Thursday morning services ending with a full reading during the following Shabbos morning services. The reference told of in Judaism to that of the Promised Land are more of a symbolic nature as opposed to that of a literal nature. In fact, even those whom take the Jewish scriptures more literally always reference the Promised Land in a more symbolic context, because the central theme in Judaism is of the wandering refugees from Egypt whom make a religious covenant with the Almighty Creator on a mountain in the barren desert. According to the scriptures of Judaism, the Kingdom of Israel was not ruled by monarch kings, but rather the Kingdom of Israel was led by theocratic kings who had to answer to the prophets of the Almighty Creator. We at the Jewish Bundist Diaspora Movement would like to collectively apologize to all of the members of ultra-Orthodox Jewry. It is our position that both the Bundists and the ultra-Orthodox lacked any type of genuine communication in the time of the old Jewish labor Bund. Any and all Bundists who disagree with our position on building new relations with ultra-Orthodox Jewry cannot possibly represent Bundism. The Bundist movement takes a controversial stance because it is correct to do so. We of the Jewish Bundist diaspora movement declare Neteria Karta International to be the leaders of our generation. This is not an attack on Satmar. We acknowledge that Satmar and all other Jewry of the ultra-Orthodox sects that join in with the Torah True Organized Jewry are inherently 100% kosher. Rather, we find Satmar to be incapable of carrying on the wisdom of the sages. We of the Jewish Bundist Diaspora Movement recognize the Catholic Churches, Eastern Orthodox Churches, and Oriental Orthodox Churches embody authentically to the context of Christianity. The memory of Chabad Labovitch is not to be attacked, yet the result of Menachman Mendel Schneerson's legacy has produced a new Chabad. As of now, Chabad is not Jewish. Furthermore, Rebbe Schneerson was not the Messiah. The Bundist movement rejects Protestant Christian Restorationism in all of its manifestations, regardless if it's Pentecostal, Baptist, non-denominational, Evangelical Fundamentalist, Seventh-day Adventist, chiefly the Mormon Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and the Messianic Jews for Jesus due to the fact that Messianic Judaism is slander and Mormonism is Americanism made into a spiritual creed. Claiming this to be a sectarian move on our part is like telling someone that rejection of fascism is somehow sectarian. The Bundist movement does not discriminate against Reform Judaism, 
conservative Judaism or reconstructionalist Judaism. As a matter of for Orthodox Jewry to settle as an internal problem. Likewise, the Bundist movement does not discriminate against original Protestant Christians such as Lutheran, Episcopalian, Calvinist, Presbyterian, Methodist, Anglican, the Quaker groups, or Anabaptist groups like the Mennonites, as these matters are internal problems for the Catholics to settle as an internal problem. Rabbi Yisrael Dovid Weiss is a member of Niteria Carta, as is Rabbi Dovid Feldman. This is Rabbi Yisrael Dovid Weiss of Niteria Carta giving his response to the disastrous decision made by Donald Trump. Jews lived with Muslims and Christians in Palestine for hundreds of years! History is to be respected. History teaches us. Wise men look at history. History tells us that we didn't need any human rights groups to protect us. We stood in solidarity and harmony, Jews and Muslims and Christians. We babysat each other's children daily. Our most precious object we gave. How is that possible? Because this is not a religious conflict. This has nothing to do with the difference of religion. This is a Zionist vile propaganda. Zionism has the audacity to accuse the Muslims of hating Jews. How dare you? How dare you? Sully the name of Jews by accusing Muslims of hating us when they provided a safe haven for hundreds of years by the Inquisition, by the Crusades, and by World War II. How dare they speak in our name? How dare they sully the name of the people that embraced us and helped us? We will not accept it. It is unacceptable. It is unacceptable. It is ungodly. It is illogical for Jewish people to be Islamophobic. Anti-Semitism is both Judeophobia and Islamophobia. Jihad means struggle, and there are many forms of jihad. Zionism is not Jewish. Zionism is an anti-Semitic crusade waged on Islam, Eastern Christianity, Judaism, and Palestine. Zionism is modeled after Americanism. Americanism is a form of spirituality that has its roots in the founding of Plymouth Colony and the events of Manifest Destiny. Americanism should not be confused with constitutionalism. Donald Trump is clearly the first openly Americanist president, and this explains much of his policies. The left-right paradigm is easy to explain, yet not everyone understands it. Many once did, not so much anymore. In George Orwell's book, 1984, we learn about Newspeak. When a word has lost its context, this corrupts the thinking of individuals as well as collectives. For example, this is a picture of false left-right paradigm number one. This is just a pathetic one. This fake paradigm was put out by two American Republican parties called the Democrats and the Republicans. It's spread around by the mainstream corporatized media and expressed by only those media zombies that believe in such nonsense. This false left-right paradigm is the left-wing liberal versus the right-wing conservative. All right, this is a picture of false left-right paradigm number two. Uh, this second paradigm is a more elaborate one. Way, um, definitely more elaborate than the previous, but still false. So it's the far left monarchy, the center left oligarchy, the centrist democracy, the center right republic, and the far right anarchy. And ultimately, what it comes down to is its total government on the left and no government on the right. And then this is a picture of false left-right paradigm number three. 
So you'll see that the top is considered authoritarian and the bottom is considered libertarian. And left right is in economic terms and the economic left would be opposed to the economic right. And uh, so I would say that in the upper left we have the authoritarian left. And then on the lower left we have the libertarian left. On the upper right we have the authoritarian right, and on the lower right we have the libertarian right. This is a picture of the correct left-right paradigm. This has been, and still is, the only left-right paradigm. The left wing is revolutionary and or rebellion. The center is reformist and or liberalism. The right wing is bourgeoisie and or conservatism. Liberals are usually the ones saving the power structure as they make concessions and offer handouts, which causes the masses to not seek revolution. The conservatives represent all powers to the elites, while the revolutionaries are the ones seeking to educate the masses with truth. And typically, revolutionaries will achieve ends by all means necessary true revolutionaries will only do what's necessary and not lose their cool if they are sincere and organized. Capitalism is not free trade, and the free market is not free trade. Free trade works as simplistic trade autonomy. Socialism protects free trade among individuals and ensures fair trade among groups. Markets are systems of economic imperial control over that trade. Free markets are markets that bypass public interests while surviving under the protection of the state. The early stages of capitalism use free markets as a way to generate more profit. Then the capital enterprises centralize into monopolies. Capitalism is driven by the profit motive. In the system of capitalism, the maximizing of profits is more important than the welfare of mankind. Capitalism requires that the employed work harder for less income. Capitalism is also a policy between the employer and the employee. Employer and employee economically operate as slave and master. The employed do not keep the fruits of their labor in capitalism. In both socialism and capitalism, all labor customer service included, has a set value. In the socialist economy, those who work, work together, and they each get paid according to how much they merit in their labor effort. Yet in the capitalist economy, those who work get their labor taxed by bosses, corporations, franchises, and banks who put the companies in debt, causing the companies to further tax the labor of the employees. Within the socialist system, the family home is protected as a right to life. Within the capitalist system, the family home is held hostage by landlords. Within the socialist system, the money is based on credit in the name of prosperity. Within the capitalist system, the money is based on debt in the name of profit. Capitalists always say, you are free to leave this job. It is a matter of choice. Bundists reject communist theory, whether that communist theory is Marxist or anarchist. Bundists do not seek theocracy, yet Bundists do not slander theocracy. Bundists seek direct democracy and national cultural autonomy. Communists slander theocracy all the time. They also ignore much history to maintain this slander, yet at the same time, Bundists will stand in solidarity with Communists whenever they are being ethical. Bundists do not seek to strike at Communists by using sectarian slander. Bundists and Communists are both Socialists. Bundists, however, do not believe in Communism. It is true that Bundists, Marxists, and Anarchists have been forming autonomous Antifa groups against the domestic fascists attacking Mexicans and Muslims in urban cities of Arizona. These autonomous Antifa groups have not attacked unarmed civilians. Hence, this is why no news coverage has been given. 
The more organized an Antifa gathering is, the less media that Antifa gathering will ever receive. Just as the ultra-Orthodox Jewish groups in the Zionist state shut down the streets with marches because they refused to be drafted into the Zionist army and harm Palestinians, the Antifa in Arizona can and will shut down the streets with marches because we will not let the police brutalize anymore. Antifa has shown no fear of domestic fascists in Arizona, and thus Antifa will show no fear of police. Bundists do not support gun control, and neither do any of the communists that associate with Bundists. Guns don't kill people. Police pigs kill people. Police pigs who do nothing about neo-Nazi terrorist thugs. Police pigs that consider racial profiling to be justified. Police pigs who frisk teenage girls and grope their breasts. Such teenage girls need to be armed. Capitalism is the crony economic system of ownership into the hands of the wealthy classes of the world, ruling without the consent of the governed. Socialism is the economic system that, when studied from a historic point of view, is the economic system of the world religions. There are two types of socialist. Number one, non-communist. Number two, communist. Bundists fall into the category of non-communist. Marxists and anarchists both fall into the category of communist. Communists are socialists that seek to use socialism as an economic transition to communism. Communism is a society without differing religions and without differing cultures. Communism is a Eurocentric goal that neglects to look at the world beyond Occidental egoism. Sadly, the communists are confused and they misapply human nature. This is one of those few things that the capitalists are actually correct about. Just not the way that capitalists would assume. Socialists of the non-communist variety understand this mess much better. And basically, the communists equate humans with dogs. They see that different kinds of dogs breed with each other. Thus, the communists seek to remove all differences in consciousness because they falsely assume that their Eurocentric philosophy is accurate. Communists are not even likely to admit that theocracy is more ideal than the goal of communism. Socialists of the non-communist variety are more likely to equate humanity with flowers. Certain flowers can not coexist within the same soil. Yet, coexistence does work within the context of multicultural cooperation like a garden. Capitalism in its early stages uses the free market system, yet capitalism is a system that in its beginnings is driven by much competition equating to an inevitable economy of winners who win big and losers who lose big. The conclusion of capitalism is always monopoly. Much of the confusion is that people think that their possessions equate to private property. The possessions of a person or a family equate to personal property. Communities are dependent on public property, not private property. Socialists defend the rights of personal property and public property. If a corporation could own all the water on planet Earth, then this would be a perfect example of private property. Just to avoid any confusion, socialists do reject nationalism. Yet not all socialists reject patriotism. A patriot is simply a person devoted to his or her country. We are in a time of extreme disinformation. Private central banks are capitalist institutions. Yet many would like to say that it is corporatism that creates these private central banks. Corporatism and National Socialism are both forms of classical fascism. All socialists, whether non-communist or communist, are opposed to both corporatism and National Socialism. Socialists are against fascism. Neither of these ideologies, corporatism or National Socialism, could ever be confused as forms of socialism. Remember that both corporatism and National Socialism belong to the category of classical fascism. Corporatism 
is rhetorical idealism using a blend of capitalist and socialist statements to boost up against her thuggery in the form of ultra-nationalism. National socialism is a racialist theory using emotional platitudes to detract blame away from the guilty onto victims. National socialism is not socialism. Anarcho-capitalism is not anarchism. National socialists believed in privatization because they shunned socialism. Yet opportunistic liars would say that the National Socialists had abolished private property. The truth is that they embraced private property more than the Germanist capitalists had. Private property is oligarchic ownership of natural resources. If a corporation owns a mountain, this would be a great example of private property. Anarcho-capitalism is not anarchism, because anarchism is a form of communist theory. And communist theory is within the variety of socialist thought. Anarcho-capitalism is based on the utopian belief of perfect competition. Anarcho-capitalism is also based on private property without the state. Yet the entire purpose of the state is to secure private property. And indeed, the only way to secure private property is the state. Perfect economic competition has never existed and can never exist because economic competition is always a contest that concludes in economic bias. Abraham Weisfeld, PhD, World Social Forum, August 8, 2016. Montreal, Quebec. Now, uh, in terms of uh, my own background and qualifications, uh, uh, in order to do my doctoral studies, I came from Ontario, from Toronto, here to Montreal, to uh, uh, continue my doctoral studies at the uh, University of Quebec in Montreal. Learned French in order to do my doctoral thesis. Uh, because uh, no other political science department in a Canadian university would allow me to do a doctoral thesis, even though I was qualified to do so. I uh, started doing my uh, university studies in, uh, in a Bachelor of Science in Physics, actually, at the University of Waterloo. But because of Palestine, I found it necessary to uh, drop this uh, scientific studies and uh, went into the graduate school in political science in order to pursue uh, um, the study of uh, political theory, political philosophy, and uh, uh, the uh, methodology required to do a, a proper critique of, uh, of the Zionist ideology, uh, which uh, I have now, now done, uh, now accomplished. and. Uh, my, my doctoral thesis, which is uh, published uh, there actually, does a critique of Zionism, not from a historical point of view, because that's been done. The, uh, the new historians, you know, specifically the most uh, principled of which is uh, Professor uh, Ilan Pape at Exeter University in England, has done an excellent, you know, breakdown of what happened in 48 and, and uh, the, uh, the plan, Dalit, uh, of the Zionist militias at that time to expel the population of Palestinians to the greatest extent possible to achieve the occupation of the greatest uh, amount of territory possible. So even though the UN Resolution 181 was, uh, was the uh, legal justification for the establishment of the Zionist state, nonetheless, we find that the uh, end result of the war of 1947 to 48, actually, because the Zionist war against the Palestinian people started before the recognition of the uh, state of uh, Israel by the United Nations, and the expulsion of the Palestinians began before the UN actually took up uh, and supported the resolution for the recognition of the Zionist state. And uh, the amount of territory that was allocated under Resolution 181 was about a third of the territory of Palestine. 
And uh, during the war of 48, the Zionist militias took control over two-thirds of the territory of Palestine. So while the uh, Zionist state claims Resolution 181 as justification for its legitimate existence and recognition internationally in the geopolitical system, actually, uh, in Resolution 181 is a denial of the legitimacy of the present-day Zionist state because it uh, ex exemplifies the fact that the Zionist militias disregarded the resolution and the frontier that was established by the partition resolution, so-called, and went beyond that uh, frontier to establish the 1948 State of Israel, which was later recognized by the United States of America within uh, the same day. Actually, Russia beat uh, the United States to the recognition of the Zionist State of Israel because the Communist parties throughout the world were pro-Zionist at the time and actually supplied not only diplomatic and propaganda support through the various communist parties, but actually supplied the arms from Czechoslovakia so that the Zionist militias were able to fight and uh, win that uh, particular war against the Palestinians. Now, in terms of uh, the, uh, the work that I've been able to do, do so uh, rather than going into the historical aspects, uh, and uh, rather than going into the uh, Judaic critique of Zionism, which is done as well by various individuals like Min, uh, Min, uh, Minhuin's uh, father, and uh, even some conservative, you know, right-wing uh, critiques uh, of Zionism, like the book Perfidy, which uh, critiques, you know, the Zionist militias as well. Uh, there is a modern-day uh, critique of uh, Judaic critique of Zionism from Professor Yaakov Rapkin, who teaches at the University of Waterloo, uh, uh, excuse me, University, uh, Université de Montréal, uh, here. And uh, so, those areas have been taken care of. What I have done is an elaborate critique of the Zionist ideology in political philosophy, going back to the origins of the nation-state concept which has been used by the Zionist ideologues to establish a state uh, along the lines of, uh, of, uh, of the European you know, political uh, uh, philosophy 200 years later, totally out of context, in a completely different uh, part of the world, which has had a history um, which is very much older than that of Europe. You know, in Europe, the nation-state concept could be floated, you know, for a while, because Europe was colonized uh, only uh, after uh, the long period in which, you know, the Middle East was, so, you know, was, uh, you know, peopled, you know, by the migrant, the human migration patterns coming out of uh, Africa. So, in the Middle East, we have, you know, cities established, you know, seven thousand years ago. Some of the first cities in the world, in uh, in Jericho, in uh, in uh, Salome, uh, which was you know the predecessor of the city now called Nablus, or in Hebrew it's called Shem, which is the Israelis now use. When I actually went to Tel Aviv to visit uh, my cousin who was uh, visiting her parents who still live there, and uh, people would ask me, where am I living? And I would say in Nablus. And the Israelis did not know the name Nablus for that city, that Palestinian city, which is one of the major cities you know, in the West Bank. They call it Shem, from the biblical, you know, Hebraic name. Incredible, you know, like difference, you know, in mentalities between the Israelis, well-meaning Israelis as well, who just do not know anything about the Palestinians. And in fact, in the entrance to the Palestinian cities, there's these huge red, you know, uh, signs there, which proclaim in three languages that it is illegal for Israelis to enter into a Palestinian city under Israeli law, and they're subject to two years imprisonment if an Israeli goes into a Palestinian city. <laughs> That's how much, you know, apartheid has been established there. It's, it's ingrained in the very law. Okay, so I have a formal presentation, which is going to be the introduction to a new book of mine, dealing with the transitional process of how, with the eventual recognition of the Palestine state, which I think is coming up in the Security Council in November after the American election and the French resolution is going to be presented to the Security Council 
calling for the recognition of the State of Palestine, which has already been adopted by the General Assembly of the United Nations, but the Security Council seems to have uh, more authority and geopolitical ma machinations. So this is a crucial vote, and this time the United States uh, State Department is probably not going to veto the resolution. So Palestine is going to be recognized as an independent state in the short term uh, after the American election and before Obama hands over you know, presidential authority to the winner of that election in January. So there's November, December, January, anything can happen. And it is expected that the United States is not going to veto uh, that resolution. So how do we proceed from that point forward? This is what I am beginning to address now. And uh, the introduction I have here is going to form the introduction to the introductory preface to uh, this new book in which I'm writing about the transitional process. Okay, first of all, I'd like to express my respects to the DSTT Culture Committee here in Montreal, which stands for Diversity, Social Solidarity, Tolerance, and Transparency, and uh, its uh, organizer, Tarek Taha, with whom I'm working here in Montreal. Um, I would welcome you to the session of the World Social Forum 2016. The forum is one with which I identify because of the momentum that is created on an international dimension that works to become a world constituent assembly that will supersede the existing nation states and its so-called United Nations. While there are now 104, 194 recognized nations in the General Assembly, with Palestine being the 194th, it should be known that there are actually about 3,000 nations throughout the world in sociological terms. So in the actuality uh, of uh, social existence in the world, the United Nations does not represent the people of the world. It represents the nation states, the geopolitical system, and ignores all those nations that have not been able to achieve their independence and ignores all the nations that are confined within the existing nation states and that do not have the recognition of a nation. And uh, we can think of many such nations, uh, including the Quebecois nation, the Kurdish nation, etc., etc. So, to break out of the bonds of the geopolitical world, we need to go to the civil society of each nation and to unite our civil societies as we are doing here at the forum. My own origin is that of a refugee kid from a Jewish family that had lived in Poland, both Warsaw and the city of Lublin. You should know that while the Zionist parties have used the Nazi Holocaust to justify a colonial project of occupation and non-expulsion, it was actually in the USSR Soviet Union that the most Jewish people fled to in order to escape from the Nazis. So about 500,000 escaped to Russia, while the Zionists made deals with the Nazi regime to get 60,000 of their own party members out of Germany and only 1,843 out of Hungary. Zionists worked with the Nazis. This is a matter of fact. A Zionist even wrote a book about this. This is a public documentation that aired on April 22nd, 1984 on Channel 5 News. Live on Channel 5, this is the 10 o'clock news with Deborah Norville. Is coming out revealing secret negotiation between the Nazis and the Zionists in 1933, which allowed German Jews and their assets to go to Palestine. Rich Samuels joins us tonight with the story of the controversy behind the book and the author's struggle to write it. Rich? Deborah, with the rise of Adolf Hitler to power in the spring of 1933, the Jews of the world were faced with a dilemma. They could raise a cry of protest, a cry few would heed, or they could make a deal with Hitler, a deal that would bring a step closer their dream of an independent Jewish state. The choice they made was difficult and agonizing. This new book describes that choice. The book is called The Transfer Agreement. This is Israel a few days ago, the season of Passover. And this is Germany 51 years ago, 
the blossoming of Adolf Hitler's springtime. A key factor in the vitality of today's Israel, the book's author argues, was an agreement reached in 1933 between a group of Zionists and the man who would later try to kill every living Jew. The great irony is that Adolf Hitler became the chief economic sponsor of the state of Israel. It will be an argument against, and the wrong argument, against Zionists. Some who lived through those times fear the response to this book. The parents of the author feared its very writing. When your son came to you and said he was going to write this book, what, was your, what were your feelings about his undertaking? I told him he's not my son anymore. Why did you say that? I told him I'm going to sit chilly. As though he were dead? That's right. I told him I don't like it. Because as being a Jew, I didn't want something to uncover my own people. I was buried in a grave with 27 people. I was seven times captured. Edwin Black's parents are Holocaust survivors. For what? My parents never talked much about the Holocaust. Just Edwin Black, to fill the void left by the silence of his parents, family. has written this book, a dense, detailed chronicle of the early months of 1933. January 30th, 1933. Hitler becomes Germany's interim chancellor. The Third Reich has begun. in this country on March 4th, attention is diverted by the inauguration of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. More power to you, President Roosevelt. The entire country's behind you, thrilled with hope and patriotism. But ominous headlines tell what's already happening to the Jews of Germany. The protest of American Jews was heard almost immediately. It was based on only the sparsest of press reports, and nowhere was that protest more vocal than here in New York City. All creeds, local and national organizations, and labor parties are joined in this gigantic demonstration passing through famous Washington Arch. Rabbi Stephen S. Wise, honorary president of the American Jewish Congress, leads the procession down Fifth Avenue on foot. Father arranged for the first great mass meeting at Madison Square Garden to protest Hitlerism. He felt that when freedom was threatened, silence condoned oppression always. Thousands who waited hours behind police lines rush forward as the doors of Madison Square Garden are open. Jews and Gentiles join in the race for seats, and 22,000 of them get in. I was a young kid then, you see. I was a teenager. And I belonged to a Zionist youth group. And uh, we were all summoned to go to that rally. Well, it was a very agitated crowd. Uh, many Yiddish-speaking few English speaking, uh, and um, Rabbi Wise uh, mounted a, uh, an appeal to the Jewish people to do something to, um, to save Jewish honor. Most of the important, well-established Jews were very angry at him, said this was sensationalism, and that if anything happened to the Jews in Germany, the blood of the Jews would be on his head. Dr. Stephen S. Wise, rabbi of the Free Synagogue and the national leader of liberal thought, speaks in behalf of the Jews of the United States. This is not a Jewish meeting. This is the conscience of America making itself felt. <laughs> The conscience of Nazi Germany made itself felt five days later. Across the Reich, Hitler's troops shut down Jewish-owned businesses for 24 hours. Within days, American Jews marched calling for the boycott of all German exports. Jews throughout Europe echoed that call. So did Jews everywhere. But a group of Zionists at the same time was quietly negotiating an agreement with the Nazis to allow the immigration of German Jews and the transfer of their assets to Palestine. That deal, reported in August 1933, was the transfer agreement. Palestine, sparsely settled by Jews at the time, was radically changed as a result. I lived in Palestine from 1933 to 1936, and uh, we saw um, every week transports of German Jews 
coming to settle in Palestine. And many new professions were introduced by then into the country, and they um, played a leading role in making Palestine then a more advanced and progressive country. Israel is really what it is because of the foundation laid by the Eastern European group and then the lift toward an educated and well-organized government that, that came with the immigration of the uh, German Jewish group. German Jewish settlement of Palestine was for a time official Nazi policy. These photos of Jewish life in Palestine, along with a lengthy text, appeared in 1934 in the Berlin paper Der Angriff. The publisher, Hitler's propaganda minister, Josef Goebbels. A Nazi Visits Palestine was the title of the multi-part series. A medal was struck by Goebbels in commemoration. On one side, the swastika. On the other, the Star of David. Hitler demanded one concession for the transfer agreement, that the call for a boycott of the Reich, raised by Jews here and elsewhere, be rejected by the Zionists. The Zionists made that concession. And so, while Nazis were marching in Germany, and while Jews were marching here, diplomacy was running a more important story. In the Mediterranean, where the dream of a nation-state for Jewish people came a step closer to reality. The story in this book some will find hard to accept. I still feel the hurt, but after I read it, I said, I'm all with you. Go ahead and write it. Because everything was exactly what happened, and that's the truth, and you cannot deny it. And the truth must prevail. And I'm not worried by the people who will find the book in bad taste, the smart people, the intelligent people, the people who went through, will understand. The author is torn, is torn between two profound feelings, that he has to be for a Jewish state, and that the silence which his parents have kept, well, he has to retaliate against that silence, and he takes it out on others. It was a quest. It took me around the world. Financially, it depleted me. Emotionally, it drained me. And as far as my being a Jewish person and understanding my Jewish identity and my relationship to Israel, and the, holo and the Holocaust, it has fulfilled me. Okay, now what you're about to see here is from Dunya, okay? Dunya is going to show you one perspective, and after that, I'm going to show you Dr. Weisfeld's perspective. Now, uh, this is very interesting. Um, I, I consider this worth its weight in gold, be like beyond anything I could verbally express to a a anybody. Uh, I mean, this, the stuff here is it's absolutely phenomenal. Uh, so first I'm going to show you this from the perspective of Dunya, and then I'm going to show you the perspective of Dr. Abram Weisfeld. You're basically looking at the same thing from two different angles. This took place in uh, Huara, okay, on February 8th of 2018. Again, that's Huara, February 8th. 2018. One more time, it is Huara, February 8th, 2018. Oh. Oh. Okay, 
التطمين الى عصابات المستعمرين المستوطنين هذا الذي يجب ان نرصده جميعا الاحتلال ومستوطنيه الى زوال وهذه الارض الفلسطينيه وسيدخل هذا المقتل وستنتصر اراده شعبنا بوحدته الوطنيه Because I am a refugee from Poland. My uncle, he was a partisan fighting against fascism. Don't make fascism here in Palestine. This is Sector A. Don't be a slave to the Zionists. For protect himself. For protect himself. No. One of those. Why you talking? What? No, no. It's you. Slave. He's a slave. He obeys the orders of his Ashkenazi masters. And he, th he thinks he is Jewish. He is taught to be a Zionist, not to be Jewish. very very good that was from the first clip uh, that clip was uh, uh, produced by uh, Dunya and um, this next clip is from Dr. Abraham Weisfeld now you'll notice that this is the same thing just from a different angle this is not from his angle so the first angle uh, you saw from uh, Dunya um, from her camera now you're gonna see it from Dr. Abraham Weisfeld's camera it's the same thing. And the reason why you're seeing this is you're seeing this now from two different angles. You're seeing an event from two different angles, which means that you can see just the raw reality. As it's said in the opening credits, this is not staged, okay? This is real. This is real life, what you're seeing. And this has everything to do with why they that why there's there's like desires from high ups to censor the internet because this is what they don't want you to see this is some really 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 good footage uh good good footage very good footage this is the type of stuff that people have been trying to find for a while well come here come to the Bundist movement we will show you these things and uh we'll be providing a link by the way to uh, uh dunya's uh youtube channel as well as dr abram weisfeld's channel I think that it bears mentioning also that we are very, very grateful to Dr. Abraham Weisfeld. Uh, I recall that, you know, it was just uh, me and Donna Newman who were pretty much working together. And then we decided to take um, 
based on what Donna Newman has suggested, take the principles and the structure and the logic behind the JPLO and expand it. Uh, she used a lot of her aunt's information. In fact, the Bundes movement flag was made by her aunt. And, you know, now we have an actual operation going. And we will create a world court, by the way. Uh, a world constituent assembly. I will accuse many of these people myself. I will, I, 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 and I know Dr. Weisfeld will be the first among us all because he has been in the West Bank. So before any of us talk, we know that he's going to be speaking. We've got a lot to show you in the upcoming years, we hope, to, to, to cover other issues such as what's going on with the indigenous Mex yes, the indigenous Native American group known as the Mexicans. You know, they're Native American. They're not Latino or Hispanic. Um, as a Sephardic Jewish person, I am Latino and I am Hispanic. But anyway, I digress. Take a look at this footage. Okay, we're in video mode now. The soldiers are advancing on the demonstration here. Peaceful demonstration with flags only at the Hawara checkpoint. في جمعة الوفاء للشهداء في جمعة الانتصار للقدس العاصمة في جمعة في جمعة استمرار المقاومة الشعبية ضد هذا المحتل ضد هذا الإجرام ضد هذه الحكومة. فسمخستي دو. Why are you here? Go away. يلا. Speak English? Yes. I have no idea what you're saying. Turn down the camera. No. Why? No. No pictures. Why? Is this a dictatorship? Look, if you shoot anybody, you will we be charged shoot. in a popular tribunal. Okay, we don't shoot. And I will be your accuser. Okay, we don't shoot, go back. Then leave us alone. We need to go back. Why? It's a military area. No, it's not. This is a you public highway. This is Nablus, Sector A. Yes or no? No. No? Huh. After the checkpoint is sex to Sextoray, why is there a checkpoint there? I did. There no one one person throwing stone. That's all. Why? I'm journalist. We are ready to don't tell. Why? Give me a reason why. Is this democracy or dictatorship? The fifth time you want to I want to say you turn down the camera. Why? Give me a reason, one reason. Why? Military area? No, this is a highway. You cannot make this whatever you want. This is not a dictatorship. I'm from Canada. I'm a journalist. And I'm a journalist. Okay, so this is what it is. He must be responsible for their actions. He has promised that he will not shoot. Oui.
What's the problem? What, you're ashamed of what you are doing? Are you, when you go home, you say you are proud. Here you are ashamed. What? No picture. Oh, you're why? Give me a reason why. You are ashamed? Yes. Oh, oh. Huh? Huh? Then stop doing yalla, what you are doing. Kadima. I stop. don't speak English. Yalla, Hitler. Oh, you speak Yiddish? No. No. Hebrew? No, live red. Yiddish. You can't arrest a journalist. He thinks he can arrest a journalist. Illegal. You want to be charged in future? Don't touch. What's your problem? You want me to charge you if you arrest me? I want to get charged. I want to be slow. Uh -huh. You want to arrest a Jewish person in the supposed land of his... Anna Yehudi. Ah. Are you Jewish? You, you are Jewish? Me too, so leave me alone. You have to be a Jewish. You cannot shoot anybody. You cannot kill anybody. You cannot hurt anybody if you are Jewish. Because I am a refugee from Poland. My uncle, he was a partisan fighting against fascism. Don't make fascism here in Palestine. This is Sector A. Don't be a slave to the Zionists. No, no, catch him. What? The, why are you talking? What? No, no, it's a, a little loot. He's a slave. He's a slave. He obeys the orders of his Ashkenazi masters. He, and he, th he thinks he is Jewish? He is taught to be a Zionist, not to be Jewish. Okay, en avance. Abraham Weisfeld, PhD, Social Forum, August 8th. 2016, Montreal, Quebec. So about 500,000 escaped to Russia, while the Zionists 
made deals with the Nazi regime to get 60,000 of their own party members out of Germany and only 1,843 out of Hungary. And yet, the Zionist mentality continues to claim its superior position as the refuge of the Jewish people, even while they did so little to actually save the Jewish people during the Nazi occupation of Poland and the other regions there. Now, the great thing about being a second generation survivor was that my mother was from Warsaw and she was a Jewish Bundist. Now, you probably don't know what the Jewish Bund was because not only is the history of the Jewish Bund suppressed by the, uh, the forces that uh, the political, political science uh, departments that failed to recognize uh, the existence of the Jewish people before the establishment of the State of Israel, because before that the Jewish nation was not supposed to exist. Therefore, it's you know wiped out of you know like historical analysis. But the Jewish Bund and what it stood for was also suppressed by the Zionist educational system, which took over all of the uh, Jewish educational institutions throughout uh, North America, South America. For instance. Um, I went to a Jewish Heger, as it's called in Yiddish. In fact, English is not even my first language, and my first language is Yiddish, which is a German, a Jewish dialect of German from the Middle Ages, and it's not it doesn't resemble Hebrew at all. Now, so I'm going to explain to you what the uh, Jewish Bundist uh, philosophy is, because it is the uh, fundamental critique of Zionism that you may not know that the Jewish socialist movement was more popular than the Zionists amongst the Jewish community of Eastern Europe is essential to understanding the difference between Zionism and the Jewish, uh, uh, Jewish people, basically. As a result, I was raised in the Jewish and anti-Zionist and anti at the same time. I did not have to torture myself to escape from a Zionist upbringing, since I was allowed to know that you don't have to be a Zionist to be Jewish. The culture as religion was assumed as a given, and although we did not care to consider the validity of the theocratic religious matters after the Holocaust, the congregation each Saturday morning was the key to life. In addition to the public Protestant English school in Toronto, I also studied at the Jewish Talmud Torah in the evenings. Talmud Torah means the study of the Torah. The educational methodology in the Torah study sessions was to read through all of the Hebrew version and translate it into English. One sentence after another over seven years, together with the other books like the Talmud, the Gemara, the Mishnah. It's a very elaborate, you know, culture. However, and the great consequence was that I actually knew what was written in the Torah and so knew that the Zionist pretensions were false as to their claims in Judaism for the establishment of this Zionist state. Aside from the matter of whether the deity is a valid concept or not, or not, we can nonetheless delve into that historical text to find out what was intended in the first place, rather than what the Torah has been manipulated to be believed. For example, while it is not mentioned, it is evident that the historical figures, who were called prophets by uh, named, you know, uh, Noah and Abraham, were historical figures that preceded the existence of the Jewish people or nation, and it may be, as it, as it may be called, as such, the covenant with Abraham was not a covenant with the Jewish people alone. You know, this is evident if you just consider, you know, the basic facts that Abraham existed 500 years before the establishment of the Jewish people. So right then and there, you know, you have a completely different perspective than what is presented, you know, by the Zionist ideology. In the text, as it is actually written, even in the re revised Ezra version, that the covenant for the land of Canaan, for guarantee of residence and co-residence with the existing nations there, which were seven, there were seven nations coexisting in the Canaan territory there of what is now called the Holy Land, was for all the descendants of Abraham forever. Mm -hmm. and the word forever is exact. It is the actual word used in Hebrew in the Torah. 
And the word descendants, descendants of Abraham, is also translated as the seed of Abraham or the sons of Abraham. In this news clip that I am about to show you, you can see Muthur Amira getting arrested. This unlawful arrest took place on December 27th of 2017. Munther Amira is a Palestinian social worker who has five children. That was the unlawful arrest of Munther Amira that took place on December 27th, 2017. Munther suffers from high blood pressure and is currently detained in the Zionist controlled Ofer prison. I now take you to a protest right outside the Ofer prison. This is the protest outside the Ofer prison where Munther Amira is held. Okay. February 19th, 2018. It's going to be very graphic, so brace yourself. <laughs> Are you proud of what you're doing? You are proud? You are proud of what you are doing? Oh, he is proud of what he is doing. Then what's your name? Tell us, what is your name? Huh? No name, huh? What is your name? What is your name? 
يلا اجلي اجلي منها انا معاك قول لا لا للاحتلال لا لا للاحتلال ايه غير سيديش لا لا للاحتلال روع بيتك روع اسرائيل دوله ارهاب اسرائيل دوله ارهاب اسرائيل دوله ارهاب اسرائيل دوله ارهاب واحنا منها ما منها واحنا منها ما منها واحنا منها ما منها Oh, he's pulling out a grenade. He's grabbing the uh, ring. So he can throw the. Uh, it's a uh, one of those big uh, black rubber canisters that are uh, sound bomb and gas. direction. Flags. 
hit in the center of my chest. And now they're ordering the journalists away. Did you see that? Did you see that? They just hit Dr. Weisfeld with a gas grenade. <sighs> this is a gas grenade which fires off. Then the head formed around a disc about uh, 2.5 centimeters, I think, across an inch with a smaller ring on top. That, fire, that flies out, basically, and then explodes on contact. This rubber grenade formed into a rubber ball bounces along in an unpredictable manner until the top flies off and might hit any place. Alright. That soldier just threw the grenade directly at Dr. Weisfeld. The rubber head hit him in the chest, compressing his chest while burning his sweater. As he is about to notice, his sweater has been burned. <laughs> anyway, he's gonna have to throw another one. There it is. He's throwing it against the Germans. Documented. They're attacking the journalists. No demonstrators here right now. Everybody's retreated. There, he's taking a flag and throwing it down on the ground. There's more flags still, still flying. Demonstrators defying them, so is he. Another one. What is this? Is the uh, piece that's uh, been pushed out by the grenade? It's probably what hit me in the chest. Oh, burn my sweater. Here's all the journalists. Now they're advancing. They're going out to the demonstrators down there. They just threw another one now. There it goes. Oh, yes. They want to make the way for the uh, supply uh, trucks to come in here. Oh, here's another one. Oh. Camera fell down. Damaged. 
There's no way. It shoots out this thing on the top. That's what hit me before. I'm gonna bring the truck in to supply the prison. Yeah, BB two two. I'll show you the uh, where it exploded. Here's the writing. New type, it shoots off the top. Okay, let's see uh, how brave he is. Oh, yes. Oh. What's the problem? You're afraid of journalists? What? Soldiers have just arrested somebody on top of the hill there. Yeah, soldiers are right on top there with a jeep. Okay, we're going to skip ahead now to um, further footage. And when we skip to this footage, you're going to see more. And then it's going to skip right to the end of the footage where Dr. Abram Weisfeld will be in the Red Crescent Ambulance. But before that, that he's going to challenge the Zionists, who don't seem to know anything about Judaism. They don't seem to know anything about Jewishness. They don't seem to know anything about international law, even. Yeah, so... Please watch. Uh, threatening journalists now. Uh, oh, they're trying to arrest the journalists. Taking the camera as well. What's the problem? Is this a dictatorship or a democracy? You're proud? What's your name? Mr. Yayid? 
روح لغاد بدي على السيارة لا لغاد على السيارة بدي اركب السيارة واروح تروح لغاد هسه كلها طب السيارة بتروح لغاد قديمة كابتن السيارة بس بس لان كان نحن غازلينها بيت اخشاب قمر السيارة نحن 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 Another journalist being arrested. I think there's a journalist in this jeep now, detained. That's his face. Orange beard. Are you proud? Okay. What's the problem? Are you afraid of me? Why? I have no gun. You have a gun. I don't have a gun. You can. You can feel my in, inside the car. You can. Because it's, 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 but you can't arrest a journalist. But you can't. It's, it's an army. Maybe. Okay. But you can't arrest a journalist either. It's not a dictatorship. And are you Jewish? I don't think so. I am Jewish. You are not. You are a Zionist. There's a difference. You have to learn something from me. She knows English, but she doesn't know anything about the law. <coughs> okay, this man, he was sprayed in the face with uh, cayenne powder spray, and he was hit on the leg by a rubber bullet. He's being uh, given oxygen right now. We're going to the hospital. We're traveling in the ambulance of the Red Crescent Society. And uh, I'm in the ambulance uh, because I was hit by the uh, head of a gas grenade in the chest. Which was at close range and it burned uh, my sweater and seemed to hit me on the rib here. The redness is gone right now because of the cold pack. But uh, the uh, rib hurts on the inside, so we're going to take an X-ray of it. This man is still sweating profusely even though we're out of the sun. Jewish relations with Muslims have always been good. The United States of America and the State of Israel cannot hide this fact. Americanists and Zionists have only one way of fighting the truth, and that is to ignore history. The Bundist movement is a political organization that seeks Jewish autonomous rights collectively for the Jewish people and protection for the rights and practices of Judaism. Our policies on Jewishness are orthodox in nature, and yet we recognize modern orthodox Judaism, conservative Judaism, reconstructionist Judaism, and reform Judaism. The Jewish Bundist diaspora movement holds no animosity towards the Satmar Jewish community. We, the Jewish Bundist diaspora movement, recognize Satmar and their organization, the True Torah Jews. However, we at the Jewish Bundist Diaspora Movement feel that Satmar does not represent the Torah culture or the religious covenant of Moses, our teacher. As the Bundist Movement aims to be kosher, we do respond to a type of international leadership in our Jewish public relations. And as far as we recognize, it is the Neturia Karta Jewry that are the leaders of our generation. Any and all disagreements we might have with the ultra-Orthodox shall be met only on the grounds of Torah. 
However, this is an internal affair among Jewry and hence does not concern those non-Jewish. Chabad is a problem, no doubt about this, but they got one thing correct, outreach. Yet they never cut off Zionists who seek to give Judaism a cure, as if being Jewish was some kind of infection. Occidental secularists, who have their hands in Hollywood and the vile stages governments of America and Israel, capitalists who are involved in dirty business and mafia exploitation of the poor, Americanists, who pretend that no injustice has been carried out against the Native American peoples. The policy of the Bundist movement are orthodox in nature. We will take over the modern orthodox Jewish institutions. First, by instituting our own Jewish outreach centers, then by strangling all Zionist control over the modern orthodox Jewish institutions. All those who seek the ultra-orthodox Jewish way of life, we will direct them towards Nateria Kart. I'm going to clear up a big, big misconception. There is a major misconception that the Islamic Republic of Iran is hostile to Judaism and the Jewish people, and this is just a flat-out lie. I am not making the claim that Iran has no problems, but if you pay attention, everybody's hyping up these protests in Iran which largely have to do with economic protests, as in protests against capitalism. We also know that there's provocateuring going on. Now, it should be to a different documentation that all the subject concerning Iran should be dealt with. But what needs to be approached right now is that there is a Jewish population of Iran. They have one of the highest Jewish populations, and they are not persecuted for being Jewish over there. There may at times be some discrimination, as all groups get discriminations from time to time in Iran, but it's not, it's not as bad as the United States of America. I'm sorry, the United States of America, dis discrimination is almost like a social policy. Whereas in Iran... Anybody that discriminates against anybody is often shunned. And that's a fact. Because it does happen, but they get shunned. Because it's not the social norm in Iran. It's also not true that there's a big persecution of Sunni Muslims in Iran. That's just not true. Yes, the dominant philosophical outlook of Iran is Shia. But that's because of the characteristics of Iran. We can get into this deeper on another documentary. As I had said just before. That being said, I want to make it clear that the Jewish people of Iran are proud Iranian citizens. And by the way, Iran is the same exact thing as Persia. And if you know anything about Judaism, the strongest root of Judaism is not Greek civilization, and it's not even... Uh, the Babylonian civilization that became that, that that came before that came before Persian dominance. It was it's Persian society that really kicked off Judaism. You should read the Book of Esther, whether it's an allegory or a myth or completely literal, is not really relevant. Again, the Bundist movement is a political organization, a political movement, a political drive in defense of Jewish autonomy, okay? But one cannot escape the fact, the fact that Judaism is a cultural religion and no Judaism equals no Jewish person, all right? But Bundism is a political position. Therefore, the motivations here are political. So we have a hostile um, state of Israel that's constantly trying to provoke Iran. Iran has a right to defend herself. I'm going to make that clear. Iran has a right to defend herself. There's, no one should have nuclear bombs, period. But as long as the great big Western powers have nuclear bombs, it's kind of sick 
twisted and vile to suggest that a country like Iran shouldn't have a nuclear bomb. So the Iran deal is another thing that is for, again, that all goes to a different documentary, and hopefully we will be able to get to that in a documentary. But right now we're going to approach this topic, the Jewish citizens of Iran, who are, by the way, proud citizens of, our, of Iran. The Jewish citizens of Iran are very proud to live in Iran. And from what I've gotten from many of them, they actually are afraid of the state of Israel more than anything. That's what they're really afraid of. Because Judaism is respected in Iran. It's not as respected in the state of Israel as a lot of people are led to believe, as they are deceived to believe. This is a clip from a documentary called Don't Tell My Mother I'm in Iran. This aired on National Geographic in the year of 2008. Another surprise in Tehran is this address I was given. It belongs to an antiques dealer. I thought in Iran he and his kind were in hiding like the Warhols or Vazarellis. Apparently not. Hello, 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 welcome, welcome. Hey. Bonjour, monsieur. Hello, sir. Live la France. Live la France. Si. Si. Vodka. Vodka. Baba Moshe is Jewish. <laughs> okay, so vodka in the Islamic Republic of Iran. Vodka. Okay, okay. okay. <laughs> Or Jewish, okay. Jewish, no problem. <laughs> chin chin. La chai. La chai. <laughs> so you make it? Kish. Kish me. Yes, it's homemade from grapes. La maison. Dans la maison. Ah, très joli. So we've got alcohol and naked women. Clearly, this is a different place in Tehran. <laughs> is it is it easy to to be Jewish here? Yes, it's very nice here. They let us be. All the rest is just lies. Here we have fun with Muslims. We laugh together, and no one bothers us. I can't obviously guzzle booze in front of the mullahs, but Iranians are great. Actually, for Jews and other religious minorities, times were hard after the Islamic Revolution. But today, the situation has gotten better. Is there a synagogue here in, in Tehran? Tehran. Yes, there are 25 synagogues in Tehran. 25 synagogues Jewish in here? Can I go to a synagogue? Picture! <laughs> <laughs> Picture! Now I can go to synagogue. <laughs> So I'm here in the heart of Tehran, in the capital of the Islamic Republic, and this is one place I never thought I'd get to wear a kippah. Uh, I'm in one of the biggest synagogues of the city, and it's it's true that it's hard to imagine that there's a Jewish community in a country where the president says that he wants to destroy Israel. I've been invited here by Siamak Mercede, one of the pillars of the Jewish community. It's absolutely incredible. They just brought out the Torah. And I must say, these are images that I never thought I would see in, <laughs> in Iran, that's for sure. This is really in 
incredible to meet an Iranian Jew. I never thought I would. <laughs> How is it to be a Jew in, in Iran? You must uh, remember that Iranian Jews are living in Iran and are Iranian for more than 30 centuries. <laughs> so it's not an interesting <laughs> phenomenon. Maybe interesting also that Iran has the greatest population of Jews in the Middle East after Israel. Of course, being a religious minority in a religious country has some problems. Mm -hmm. But they are not majors. People compare, I think, a little bit you know, the condition of Jews here to the condition of Jews in Germany before the war. You know? They are not, uh, they cannot be compared with each mm -hmm. other because in Germany was faced with a fascist and racist regime. Mm -hmm. But in Iran, we do not have a fascist system. Uh, maybe there are some conflicts between Iranian government and Israel. Mm -hmm. But it does not affect the life of Iranian Jews mm -hmm. because according to Iranian thoughts and Iranian government and also, Iranian people, there is a distinct separation between Zionism and Judaism. Yeah, so the political conflicts between Iranian government and Zionism does not affect the day-to-day -day life of Iranian Jews. Iranian Jews, great. Is it a mix here between Iranian yes. art culture and Jewish Correct. It's a, Correct. Mixture, yeah? it's a combination between Iranian culture and Jewish culture, which you can see in many of Iranian synagogues. Uh -huh. Mercedes wants to show me another of Tehran's temples, the temple of politics. Welcome to the Iranian parliament. The constitution here guarantees that every ethnic and religious minority has a parliamentary seat. And Mercedes represents Iran's 25,000 Jews. Here I am inside of the Iranian parliament. And I mean, what is surprising about Iran is that Iran is a democracy. It's an Islamic democracy with its own rules, but it remains a democracy. And in the region, the other big democracy is Israel, obviously with its own rules also. Mercedes is rarely at a loss for words, but he never drifts far from Iran's political line. You feel also the ambition of Iran yes. to become a world, you know, a power. Mm, of course, Iran is a power in, uh, at least in the region and the Middle East. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And no one can do anything in this region without respecting to the benefits of Iranian mm -hmm. people, and Iranian nation, of course. Yeah. Iran is a democracy, right? Yes. Israel is a democracy. Yes. So yes. why can't these two democracies find a common uh, ground? Israel uh, is a new country which is formed by the forces from outside the region. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But Iran is an old country with uh, history roots many years ago. Mm -hmm. So this cannot be compared with each other. Of course, uh, in Israel you say that many different people are victims of homicide and vic uh, victims of uh, intolerance and victims of obligation. You mean the Palestinians? Yes. Yes, yes. I think it's the first time in my life that I hear a Jew criticizing Israel. <laughs> it's not the first time. I think you must change your idea. You can see the many people in the uh, Jewish population in different parts of the world who are criticizing the Israel. For example, Noam Chomsky. Yeah, Noam Chomsky, yeah. yeah. Or other different people. For example, the Progressive Association of Jews in Europe mm -hmm. is an association which formed at first to uh, fight against uh, fascists. Isn't that interesting? That's, by the way, one of my favorite documentaries, as that documentary is completely factual. Especially as it intertwines with my experience of Iran. That's why I get a lot of ridicule, by the way, as I'm an eyewitness. I tend to shatter people's fictional universes they live in. I get mocked often, personally, for believing in myth. Because people are like, well, you believe in science or myth? I believe in myth, but I believe myth is truth. But that doesn't mean I'm irrational. I know what reality is. So you may think that you're all great knowing this or that, but me, and others like me, have seen more than you. So, that's another thing about the boond. The boond is more concerned by what you know about this world as to opposed to what you believe. Although, within a Jewish context, we do care kind of about what you believe. So much as to whether you believe in God or not is not exactly it. Our concern largely is, is are you are you cultured in the Torah? Do you recognize that we belong to a, a society of a religious covenant? Because that's what the Jewish people are, a society of the religious covenant of Mount Sinai. 
And once again, that's irrelevant whether you believe the events of Mount Sinai with Moses are true or not. Whether you believe it or not, or not is not a Buddhist question. It's the values of the Sinai Covenant, the religious Sinai Covenant and the Torah culture. That is largely what defines, not largely, that is what defines world Jewry, and that is what defines Judaism. By the way, no, no Judaism, no Jewish. No Judaism, there's no Jewry, okay? So, I do hope people go to an order from National Geographic, that documentary, um, because it's really good. The name of the documentary, once again, is called Don't Tell My Mother I'm in Iran. I strongly suggest you watch it. Now, I will direct you to a news clip. This news clip came out on September 16th of 2016. Please watch. Well, former U.S. Secretary of State Colin Powell's emails were recently leaked, and the latest revelations have come from them in confirmation with, that, that the U.S. is well aware of the real extent of Israel's nuclear arsenal. RT's Paula Slea has the details. If you look at this leaked email correspondence of the then U.S. Secretary of State Colin Powell, what certainly is clear is that Powell acknowledges Israel's nuclear arsenal. Now, this has always been an open secret, particularly between the United States and Israel. It is, if you can call it, nuclear ambiguity. Here in Israel, whenever you question Israeli politicians as to whether or not Israel has nuclear weapons, they always answer with the standard no comment. And this is so as not to confirm or deny and also leave a question mark as to how many nuclear weapons Israel has, if indeed it does have. But what we see in this email correspondence also is Powell rejecting at that time assessments that Iran was a year away from building a nuclear bomb. Powell also goes on to say that Iran's nuclear arsenal and rational self-interest meant that the construction and the testing of any kind of Iranian nuclear weapons would be a harshly unlikely policy decision by the Iranian leadership. Take a look at some of the correspondence. Anyway, Iranians can't use a nuclear bomb if they finally make one. The boys in Tehran know Israel has 200, all targeted on Tehran. As Ahmadinejad said, what would we do with one? Polish it? Now, Powell has not denied the authenticity of the email correspondence, but what is interesting is that parallel to this correspondence and these assessments taking place, the United States introduced many harsh me measures against Iran for allegedly trying to build a nuclear bomb, while at the same time critics would argue Israel was safe and secure. There were also questions being asked as to whether or not the United States is knowingly violating its own law. There is a lawsuit that has been filed in a federal court in Washington, D.C. And according to this lawsuit, the United States aid to Israel is illegal because under another law, any kind of American aid that is given to a country, a nuclear power that has not signed the Non-Proliferation Treaty is illegal. And Israel, as co of course, as you know, is not a party to the Non-Proliferation Treaty. As of yet, there hasn't been any comment here in Israel. We've been trying to reach any kind of politicians, but of course it is the Sabbath, and at the same time it's highly unlikely that their standard response will again be no comment. You know, in retrospect, I cannot help but think about the American crisis that happened in World War II after the Pearl Harbor bombing, where Japanese American citizens, who almost all of them were loyal not to Japan but to the United States of America, they were stuck in internment camps. They didn't do this to all the German American citizens or all the Italian American citizens. They only did this to German American citizens and Italian American citizens that they confirmed were in pro-fascist groups. And then you have the Wall Street guys who really were part of an attempted fascist coup against FDR and not a single of them seemed to have gotten prosecuted. That's interesting, but almost all the American Japanese citizens were put in internment camps, and there's been pretty much almost no, no, if none, that is, no evidence of any dual loyalty. Yet, 
do loyalties okay when the subject of the state of Israel is concerned? The reason for this is simple. Americanism and Zionism come from the same root. You see, Zionism isn't Jewish. It's just not Jewish. And then furthermore, um, there are a lot of people who are angry at the dual loyal concept, like I am, but again, I put America into question as well, not just Israel. But Americanism and Israel intertwine. Just as Zionism and America are intertwined. It's, it's intertwined. It's a type of colonialism and a, and a war on the indigenous hiding behind religion while actually being hostile to religion. That being said, Iran has a right to defend herself. Just so nobody uh, gets this confused, I'm also fully aware that during World War I, which back then was called the Great War, during this World War I period, there was a massive anti-German sentiment throughout the United States of America. Okay. I was referencing World War II. I shouldn't be so long-winded, but I already know which kind of audience is going to attack this documentary. I know how many sides. I'm going to get the Zionist backlash, I'm going to get the anti-Jewish backlash, and the Zionist anti-Jewish backlash. I'm going to get backlashes everywhere. I'm, I'm also going to get the pro-blind, shrink-wrapped brain Americanists uh, yelling at me, and of course the Americanists who are in denial that they're Americanists, and the Americanists that are proud Americanists. I'll also get the confused constitutionalists that should actually have a higher perspective. I do have faith that the real constitutionalists will understand this documentary and cherish it as a valuable piece of dissent and free speech. But I won't hold my breath. You know, you got a lot of rhetoric, but let's just face it. Alex Jones, if you remember, he used to use a lot of con constitutional rhetoric. But then again, he always used was it what, whatever was good for his conspiracy theorist market. I don't lump all the conspiracy theorists together, just so you know. But it, it is a market, and Alex Jones is probably at the top of that market. He probably has monopolized the conspiracy theorist market. And that's not a Jewish problem. That's a capitalist problem. I have allies in different political groups that say he's a liberal Americanist. Maybe he is a liberal Americanist, but really what he is is he's basically hiding the real conspiracy of capitalism, as that's what his business is all about. That's why he always calls genuine capitalism crony capitalism, and, you know, there's that trend of calling genuine capitalism, capitalism uh, crony capitalism, or calling it uh, uh, corporatism. Uh, even though corporatism is not possible in the United States of America, if the fascist tendency known as corporatism was ever to arise in a country of the West, it would be in England, by the way. American fascism could never be corporatist in nature. Most people have no clue what that stuff means. And they quote Gregor Stratzer, saying he was the enemy of the capitalists, but then claimed that Hitler said it. They, they, there's all kinds of crazy crap going on by the internet dummies. Now, I understand the internet is a great tool to put out information if you know how to play the popularity contest. But anybody can say whatever they want for the most part, and that's kind of why you have to question it. There's this old meme I used to see where uh, this kid goes, Yes, it must be true because it was on the internet, or, or it was something to that effect, and that's largely what I have to put up with. Of course, I've caught several of the people who heckle me and yell at me and yell at my friends and my allies. I've caught several of them in the act of actually turning out to be spooks, or otherwise known as feds. That means agents obviously being paid by a corporation or probably working for some intelligence agency. That happens more on the internet. And that's the more high-tech COINTEL Pro that we're dealing with today. The reason why it seems like the capitalist world is making it impossible to resist them is not because socialism does not work, nor is it because religion is something 
unpractical. One of the most major reasons why any progress towards a better future is held back is because of networks that operate under the tactics of COINTELPRO. <laughs> COINTELPRO, an acronym for Counterintelligence Program. And although it is believed by many that this operation is no longer in use, there is just way too much evidence to the contrary. With the revelations of Edward Snowden and the multitude of declassified information as well as leaked information, it is all too clear that COINTELPRO still runs in operation, and even to a more high-tech manner. The reason why Bundists are not always quick to embrace every single conspiracy theory is not because we are unaware of conspiracies. The reason is that most conspiracy theories are manufactured as part of the operation of COINTELPRO. It is unlikely that COINTELPRO is still called COINTELPRO by those who participate in that operation. We Bundists call it COINTELPRO because that is the best description for that type of operation. We aim to raise COINTELPRO awareness and even show others how to identify when an agent or informant is attempting to destabilize a grassroots organization. July 11th, 2015, Rabbi Delvid Feldman speaking at Islamic Center in Atlanta, Georgia. Saturday, late evening, Shabbos. Um, I really appreciate, uh, first of all, the host here, the uh, is going to be an education uh, center, an Islam, uh, education Islamic center, and the sheikhs, the Molana. I really appreciate you having us here. It's really an honor for me for the second time to be here to share with you some thoughts that you might not have the opportunity to hear elsewhere. Uh, first of all, I really relate to the point that the sheikh mentioned before about uh, having a religion hijacked or having this face in front of a religion to get this false image. We very much relate to this point. We feel this in Judaism as well. This is unfortunately a sad happening amongst our people, amongst our religion also, as everybody knows. Uh, the news, CNN and other news outlets are using those militant people out there in the front and put them on the screen to show an image of Judaism, which is totally wrong, as in the case of Islam. There is a question that many people ask. How come that we witness this occupation in Palestine already for decades? We witness these atrocities taking place for decades and in our time. It's not only what our grandparents told us, it's what we witness today. And still in all, very few people stand up to speak about it. People ask themselves, how come I don't do enough? And everybody asks this question. There are many answers to this. One of the issues I find is one of the greatest obstacles here is the issue that people would never like to fight Almighty God. Nobody likes to fight a religion. Nobody likes to fight an ethnic group which ends up with the famous accusation of anti-Semitism. If you speak up against the State of Israel, you're anti-Semite. And if you're Jewish and you speak up, then what? Self-hating Jew. That's right. Now why? Why do people feel this way and why would people accuse this way? And the reason for this is a very sad point. The point is the confusion between Judaism and Zionism. It's because the political movement of Zionism had succeeded, are successful by confusing the masses. And as we spoke before, this CNN screen educates this. To have the people believe that Zionism, the political movement of Zionism, creating this political state and the traditional religion of Judaism is all one and the same. 
Now, one of the famous uh, issues that is always being raised, and it's so embarrassing and so painful, when we find Bibi Netanyahu standing in front of Congress in Washington DC just not very long ago, standing up and speaking about verses of Judaism, and speaking about religious concepts. And we're talking about a secular Jew doesn't observe anything within Judaism, doesn't fast on Yom Kippur, and, uh, well, nothing. Doesn't keep the Sabbath, nothing. Doesn't eat kosher. And would use religion to justify whatever he would like to present. I was once sitting on the, on the international, it's the International Day of Solidarity with the Palestinian people in the United Nations. It's an annual day. And it was like two or three years ago, I sat in the General Assembly, and that Israeli ambassador to the United Nations stands up without a cover on his head, stands up and speaks about religion. How embarrassing. The famous quote I always say is, the promised land. It's a land promised to the Jewish people. God promised the Holy Land to the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's a famous concept that everybody would use to justify all what Israel is doing. And if you criticize, then you're criticizing Judaism, you're criticizing the Holy Torah, you're criticizing God, God forbid. Now this is all wrong, and let's just stress on this one point, and that'll be enough, at least for short, to understand what's going on. And it's very important. Now the concept of the Promised Land is a true concept. It is in the Torah, God promised the Holy Land for the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But this is one side of the coin. There's the second side of the coin nobody would speak about. And this, is, this should be considered falsehood if you just show one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is that it was promised to the, to the children of Israel on condition. If you would remain in the land in the level of holiness that God requires of you, you would remain in the land. Otherwise, you would be expelled. And this is very clear. It's twice a verse in the Torah. It says, V'lo yisuki huretz eschem betamachem oisa. The land should not reject you because you defile it. In other words, if you would defile the land, then God, the land would reject you, basically. Unfortunately, this is what happened. It was several hundred years later. Um, let's go back a step. This promise was fulfilled. The Jews were brought into the Holy Land. This was 40 years after they uh, were uh, took, uh, taken out from Egypt by Prophet Moses. Four years later, they were brought into the Holy Land, and the, pr the, prophet, the promise was fulfilled. Several hundred years later, uh, God was not pleased of the behavior of the, of the people at the time. Uh, God warned the Jews through the prophets that unless they would repent to the level that God requires, they would be ex expelled from the land. And unfortunately, th this is what happened. And this was by uh, about 2,000 years ago, by the des destruction of the temple, where the temple was destroyed and the Jews were driven into exile. Now, this concept of exile was considered a divine decree, not a lack of physical power. This was a direct divine decree. This was the will of God. And this was, sadly, unfortunately, but accepted by all Jews throughout all generations, without any exception. Nobody ever denied the concept of exile and that, as religious Jews, followers of God, we have to accept this, whether it is comfortable or not. Now again, this was accepted by all Jewish people throughout all generations, until 100, approximately 130 years ago, when these founders of the philosophy of Zionism stood up. And these people were not religious scholars. They were not Jewish rabbis. They were outspoken heretics, hating God and hating, hate, hating religion. They happened to come from Jewish descent, but they had no connection at all to the Jewish religion. And they came up with this brilliant solution to this physical problem that Jewish people have. And they totally 
ignored that there is something religious behind all of this. There is something spiritual behind all of this. The, the concept of exile is meant to be a punishment, to have those people who are punished repent and turn back to God and not turn their backs to God. Ever since the beginning of this uh, f philosophy of Zionism, all religious leaders, with a very small exception, maybe five out of all of them, and these all religious leaders opposed Zionism. The main, the main Jewish community were in Europe at the time, Russia, uh, and almost all religious leaders opposed it, including the religious community in Palestine at the time. Unfortunately, after the Holocaust, when the majority of the Jewish people were killed, the vast majority of Jewish leadership were wiped out, and there was uh, remaining a desperate people, desperate for rescue, desperate for a safe haven. And then, at that point, the uh, Zionist people came and promised those desperate people everything. Just come to us and we'll save you. Many of them were ignorant. Some of them did understand what's going on, but they had no choice. We would not be the people to judge those people, but they were in real, they were real desperate. And at that point, which is what, 70 some years ago, at that point, the philosophy of Zionism started to come in amongst the Jewish people. But again, it was opposed and still is opposed by masses of Jewish people worldwide. But we have to remember that this state of Israel does not represent anything Jewish. They would use all kinds of Jewish symbols. They would misuse Jewish verses, at, as I said before, to justify whatever they are doing and to justify all the criminal acts they are doing. They would do anything they can. They would use anything they can. They would do any falsehood possible to silence you, to silence me, to silence whoever dares to stand up and to condemn and to oppose what they're doing. For example, they're using the Star of David, which is an old traditional Jewish symbol. This was never meant to symbolize materialism. materialism. This is to symbolize the four corners of the, of the world, the top and the bottom, where God rules over. This is considered a star, a star of David going back to King David at the time. King David was a spiritual person. He wrote the Psalms. King David was not about a mighty king. He was about a spiritual king that led his people in spirituality. They usurped our name, Israel. They are using our concept of Jews and Judaism for what? For a wicked movement and to commit all sorts of crimes and on top of all to turn their back to Almighty God. Nobody would say that this state of Israel is about religion. The most they can say is they would, they would be a democracy and allow religion in their state, which is not true. They oppress religion, they oppress Jewish religion in the state of Israel. It's a secular movement, it's a secular state, and it's a state which is against God and against Jewish religion. Yes, they would allow it to a certain extent where, where they, they feel it doesn't affect them. Once the religious practice will affect their heretic movement, they would oppress it, and they do. They oppress our people in Jerusalem, they oppress our people in other places. And when it comes to the point where they feel affected from what? from the practice of our religion. Now again, they don't represent the Jewish people, they don't represent Jewish religion. There is nothing Jewish in the state of Israel other than the name Jewish they are using, or the name Israel they are using, they are misusing. Again, Jewish people all over the world, whether they, you would find large, strong communities who would be strong enough to come out in public, or you would find smaller communities, as in Atlanta, Georgia, where you would find individual people that would be against uh, Israel, but not in an organized 
way that they can manage to come out in public. And we find this all the time. It's really encouraging when we visit Atlanta, we were here yesterday and I listened to some talks here before, when people of the Jewish religion and of the Muslim religion are very clear by what we are speaking about. When we criticize Israel, we have to be very specific and very clear. We are talking about an injustice taking place. We're not talking about an ethnic group of people. We're not talking about a religion. We can respect a religion. We can respect a people. We have nothing against people as people. We are against violence. We are against oppression. We are against atrocities taking place. We are against occupation. And we should condemn it. We should speak up. If we, if we all will not stand up and speak up, who would? And who would speak up if, God forbid, it shouldn't happen? If we would be oppressed, who would stand up? We have to stand up for justice, we have to stand up for righteousness, and we have to condemn evil, whether it's from other people or from our people. We pray for the speedy and peaceful dismantlement of the State of Israel, this illegitimate movement which is causing death and destruction and uprooting of religion for other people and for the Jewish people. And we hope once this political movement will end, and we believe it will end, God would not allow it to, to succeed forever. There is, there is a verse in the Torah that says, Why are you violating the word of Almighty God? It will not be successful. God allows evil for a specific amount of time but not forever. This will stop. We hope it should stop in our lifetime. We hope we should be able to see once again that beautiful peace that did exist amongst peoples from many backgrounds, from many cultures, including Palestine. There was a Jewish community, a minority, but a sizable Jewish community in Palestine before all this started. They were living in excellent peace. We have documentation on this. We have stories about this. And I'm sure you have from your commu communities many stories about this. And we should really look forward for the day when we can see this once again. And once this will be ended, then religious people would be able to practice their religion freely without this, all of this intimidation. Ultimately, we pray that the glory of the Almighty should be revealed throughout the universe. All mankind together should serve the one God and peace and harmony soon in our days. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you. Uh, the clip you just saw took place this Saturday late evening. This took place right after Shabbos. <clears throat> Alright. We return you to Avram Weisfeld, PhD, at the World Social Forum, August 8, 2016, Montreal, Quebec. This presentation will show flashbacks to the Land Day demonstration that took place on March 30, 2016, at uh, Al. Bazaria. Please watch. Matter of violence. I was in uh, 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 in Nablus uh, over the last uh, period of time. I was in, living in Nablus together with Palestinians for five months during this last winter. And when I arrived, I found that the um, the uh, community center that I helped to establish a computer room for in 2011 when I was there previously making public access computers there available for free to the internet for Palestinians in Nablus had been raided by the military and the soldiers went into the center in the middle of the night and took out all the hard drives from all the computers stole a laptop stole uh, all the Wi-Fi keys and stole the, um, um, uh, a memory stick of 130. So I started working on uh, rebuilding the computers. 
and the service that had been initiating, uh, initiated there at the, uh, at the uh, community center, which was broadcasting by internet radio Palestine news, you know, on a bi-weekly basis. And this uh, radio program started to become very popular, and the, and the Zionist you know, uh, apparatus became aware of it. And uh, in the uh, first few months, uh, there was like more than a million people who had listened to the radio broadcast because they were getting news direct from the source that was not censored and not filtered. And so all this was shut down. So I was rebuilding the computers, and then with the camera, you know, I went out to all the various demonstrations and filmed them in order to document them and put them up on my YouTube channel and established a, a YouTube uh, channel for the uh, Tanweer Center as well to continue this uh, medium. So I was at the Land Day demonstration, which is March 30th. And there, a peaceful demonstration, mostly with you know an older generation of people holding banners and flags. There was uh, no large uh, numbers of youth you know, who were there you know, just to throw stones or anything like that. No stones were thrown. Not even one stone. And this, uh, the Zionist army was there to stop the demonstration from marching down the highway to a village. <laughs> On the way to the demonstration for Land Day here in Palestine on the 30th of March 2016, we encounter a blockade on the highway, both from the, the Zionist police. And the military. We go in any case. The Zionist army was there to stop the demonstration from marching down the highway to a village. But, you know, everybody just walked around the soldiers and went right through, you know, the jeeps and everything like that, you know, and even put Palestinian flags into the jeeps' grills, you know, as a sort of a insubordination, you know, a sign of uh, def defiance. The Zionist blockade has stopped traffic entirely on this highway on the way to Tilkara. Here is a demonstration right in front of the soldiers. Note that the demonstrators are not intimidated at all. They are eager to take pictures in front of the soldiers. Yes, 
to stop the demonstration from marching down the highway to a village. But, you know, everybody just walked around the soldiers and went right through, you know, the jeeps and everything like that, you know, and even put Palestinian flags into the jeeps' grills, you know, as a sort of a insubordination, you know, a sign of uh, a def defiance. And then the military came and redoubled its numbers and went on top of the hill and set up a barrier that was impenetrable and uh, people still kept on marching towards this obstruction. So that's when they started shooting tear gas canisters, okay? About big, like this, sp spitting out gas from both sides, you know? That's the model that they use. More soldiers. More flags and soldiers, jeeps. Uh-huh. 
Demonstration stopped. There's blockade up there. Various people incapacitated by gas. The person being taken into ambulance. Was blocked again. There's all the traffic backed up. Now there's more soldiers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Soldiers are approaching. because the demonstrators are advancing. Oh, he's the one who's firing tear gas. He's firing. Four times. Right. Soldiers are throwing. Why are you trying to stop a peaceful demonstration? Peaceful demonstration, let it pass. It's just a demonstration, that's all. What's wrong with the demonstration? Just a demonstration, leave it alone. Demonstration advances. Get move, don't be
So there was, you know, one canister that was on the middle of the road in front of me. You know, people had retreated, you know, but silly me, you know, I stayed there, you know, in front of the military. I kept on filming, you know, as did a number of other people. So one young guy wanted to kick the canister away from himself, but he kicked it to the wrong side of the road. He, he should have kicked it to the side of the road, which was, you know, where there was an incline going down. And it would have fallen down, but instead he kicked it towards the upside, you know, of the hill, where I was standing, you know, in the, uh, in the gutter, you know, uh, filming. So, of course, you know, I kicked it back. And then the soldier saw me, and I was fired upon. Oh, hit my leg. Oh, right behind me. Hey, why do you do this? It's only a demonstration. It's just a demonstration. Leave it alone. Oh, water. Here's another one coming. Here. Mia, Mia. For the eyes. For the eyes. Martin! Voilà. Voilà. Pas de l'eau pour moi. Crazy. Ah. Ya Allah. Ya Allah. Ah. 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 Oh, Yalla. Oh. 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 <laughs> what? What? Okay. What? Hey, man! You got you? Oh, God. What, God? Get a bit, I mean. God? How'd you have? Uh, there he is. Tal here, tal here. Tell me. Tell me. One, two, three, four, five, six. At least six vehicles. The soldiers are coming upon us.
And I was fired upon, and I was hit by a, uh, a spherical bullet right on the bone here with the leg that I had kicked the canister, their sacred canister. And I was shot right here. And I didn't even notice anything at first, you know, because there's no nerves there. But then it started to swell, and, and the shock, it's a high-velocity projectile, uh, a metal sphere about so big covered in plastic. And they call it a rubber bullet. It sounds very innocuous, you know. But this is a high-velocity projectile, and it causes damage, you know. If it hits a soft tissue, it will tear the tissue. If it hits an eye, it will destroy an eye. If it hits a skull, it will crack the skull and cause a, con a major concussion. So uh, these are, and they call it a non-lethal uh, um, method of crowd control. And it's now starting to be used by the police in North America even, you know, because it's classified as non-lethal. However, it is, it can be lethal and it is a very severe, you know, uh, can cause very severe, you know, uh, injury to a person. Uh, I was in shock and didn't realize that I was in shock, which is, you know, a symptom of shock. And I kept on working, went to another demonstration the next morning, went to a conference the next afternoon. And then the following morning, I thought I would climb up a ladder and ended up falling two meters down onto the, uh, you know, uh, s uh, stone floor. End up uh, injuring my back, which I'm still recovering from, and uh, uh, hitting my head, going unconscious, and, and, and getting requiring four stitches to stop the bleeding. All because of that. So, and they talk about violence. The first violence is inflicted upon the civilian Palestinians by the Zionist military. Okay. Uh, whether it's called uh, 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 crowd control or whatever, it's still violence. Then, when Palestinians attack, uh, you know, this is a war against the Palestinian people that is being conducted to the greatest extent possible permitted, you know, by the opposition that they have to endure. So, but when Palestinians retaliate against the military personnel and spontaneously Palestinians, young Palestinians even, go out and try to attack, you know, an, uh, a Zionist soldier because a member of their family has recently been killed and Palestinians are shot with live bullets at demonstrations, nonviolent demonstrations even, on an almost daily basis, and, and a Palestinian uh, with some uh, f familial connection uh, to a Palestinian who has been killed goes out and tries to retaliate on their own in a spontaneous fashion without the encouragement you know, of the uh, political authority in Palestine that has been established from Oslo. They are called terrorists. On the matter of terrorism, First, it is important to know the original Black Panther Party and the American Indian Movement was never terrorist. 
the Irish Republican Army is not a terrorist organization. The Palestine Liberation Organization and or al Fatah is not a terrorist organization. Hezbollah is not a terrorist organization. The Islamic Republic of Iran is not a terror state. Terrorism is simply the terror tactic used as a means of coercion. Furthermore, a terrorist is someone who specializes in terrorism. Carrying out the actions of one or two terrorist actions cannot make a person or a group terrorist. For example, it is known that it was an act of terrorism that helped the Palestine Liberation Organization and or al Fatah rise to public attention, yet such actions making any success are very rare. Another example being the Islamic Revolution that occurred in Iran. However, it is known that the Islamic Revolution was waged against a fascist regime. To understand the context of this, it is important to study the Iran-Contra affair. Although sympathetic to the cause of Iran, Gaddafi condemned the taking of hostages. Bundist thinking is in kin to that of Gaddafi on these matters. Genuine terrorist organizations, such as the Weather Underground, were 100% terrorist. How ironic that Bill Ayers, the terrorist, supports gun control, while the police have military weapons. Self-defense and revolution have nothing to do with terrorism. Terrorism is a counter-revolutionary tactic, and we in the Jewish Bundist diaspora movement denounce this worthless tactic. The League of Nations failed to solve the problems of the world. Imperialists cannot pass judgment on other imperialists. The Nuremberg Trials was a breakthrough, yet it was still underachieving. The United Nations was an improvement, yet it has not solved the major world crisis of genocide, human rights abuses, or world hunger. This is because debt rules the policy of globalism. Globalism is a capitalist method of stonewalling the poor. The answer can only be found in internationalism and world federalism. Banks exist to hold and store money. For that very reason, banks must never be allowed to print money. It is the duty of public treasuries to print money, not banks. Nationalizing private central banks will do nothing except make m people comfortable and complacent so that the bankers can work to denationalize and reprivatize their banks. In the United States of America, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt had managed to nationalize the Federal Reserve with the Glass-Steagall Banking Act of 1933. Then, President William Jefferson Clinton repealed this in 1999, and then the Federal Reserve was reprivatized. Centrist reforms do not work. Public treasuries must replace central banks, and they must be audited every two years if not made completely transparent. Public treasuries should be local and transcontinental, and a world court must exist to hold governments accountable, and the judges should be civilian. Those holding government office should be banned from holding these court offices. Finally, all education needs to be made free and accessible. This is the mandate to proclaim a permanent dismantlement of the State of Israel. The State of Israel has proven to be a threat to the Jewish people, the Palestinian people, and its very own citizens. Having rogue foundations hostile to world Jewry, the indigenous Palestinian population, even showing many cases of Ashkenazi racism towards the Mizrahim and the dark-skinned African refugees. Palestinians suffer under apartheid. The Mizrahim and the dark-skinned African refugees suffer under Jim Crow and Jane Crow social norms. Proclamation 1. All of world Jewry is called Israel, therefore no country has the right to use that name. Proclamation 2. The new word to describe the refugee people is changed henceforth to Lizroidi, as the word Israeli is defamatory, showing an insensitivity to both those Jewish and those Palestinian. Proclamation 3. The dark-skinned African peoples who have joined the Lizroidi people shall remain as part of the Lizroidi nation. Proclamation 4. Number 1. Funding for all Israelis who want to leave. Number 2. 
right of return for the Palestinians. Number three, ending the Zionist right of return. Number four, end of the apartheid state calling itself Israel. Number five, foundation of a multinational democratic federation. No more state of Israel. This project is called the Palestinian Hebrew Democratic Federation. One of the chief goals of the Jewish Bundist diaspora movement is the establishment of the Jewish International Bund. The Jewish Orthodox policies of the Jewish Bundist diaspora movement will shape the rules for this new Jewish International Bund. The socialism of the Jewish Bundists will be the foundation for the Jewish economic and political theory and practice of this Jewish International Bund. Take a moment every day to think about the Kurdish nation. Do they need a state? No. The Kurdish nation needs collective national rights. National cultural autonomy is when nations are self-governing, living by their own laws, recognized in a system of world affairs. What the communists, that is both Marxists and anarchists, fail to realize is that nation is not the state and that not every country throughout history has been a state. You cannot solve the world's problems by forcing Eurocentric ideas upon the world. George William Frederick Hegel fabricated the very ideas of the nation-state. Marxists are stuck in the false ideas of George William Frederick Hegel. Anarchists usually do not understand that country and state are not always the same. Marxists tend to confuse nation and state as the same thing. National security is the flavor of justification fabricated by the brutes who trample on liberty and autonomy. Long live the Jewish diaspora and the national cultural autonomy of all wandering nations. The state of Israel is not Jewish and that state will never be Jewish. Don't be a slave to the Zionists! Because I am a refugee from Poland. My uncle, he was a partisan fighting against fascism. Don't make fascism here in Palestine.
Are you Jewish? Yes, but you have to You, be you are Jewish? Me too, so leave me alone. You have to be a Jewish. You cannot shoot anybody. You cannot kill anybody. You cannot hurt anybody if you are Jewish.